Hi there, you're very welcome to this episode of Dark Vanishings. I hope you're keeping well wherever you are in the world. I'm just back from a short trip to Liverpool. It was amazing. Um, birthplace of the Beatles. I took a boat ride on the Mersey. The people are so warm, friendly, funny. Liverpudians, you are amazing. And thank you for the warm welcome uh, to your city. It's a wonderful place and I highly recommend visiting there. Today's episode actually relates to a family from the UK and that family is the McCann's and in this episode we will be exploring the disappearance of their daughter from a hotel in Portugal when she was just three years old and she has never been seen since. The video is a little darker than some of the videos that I normally do. It does relate to child abduction potential murder etc it gets a little dark in places so if you find these scenes triggering please do feel free to switch off I totally understand so just a little bit of background uh, in case you aren't familiar with the case it is one of the most famous missing cases of all time but perhaps you might want to refresh or you're just not familiar with it but on the right there we have Madeline uh, who was three when she disappeared beautiful, bubbly, vivacious young child. Um, And on the left, we see her parents, Kate and Jerry McCann. Uh, Jerry is a cardiologist and Kate a GP. Um, And we see Madeline's two siblings. She, Madeline was the eldest child. So, um, you know, they had everything going for them, happy family, great careers, etc. And of course, you know, Madeline's disappearance has left this tragic hole Uh, in their life. So much has been written about the disappearance of Madeline, but I think what's interesting about this case is that people close to the case have also written uh, about the case. So there is a book by Kate just called Madeline Simply, picture of Madeline on the front there. Um, There has been a book written by Pat Brown, who's a very experienced, highly respected profiler. And then there's also a book by Gonzalo Amaral, who was investigating the case in Portugal. And of course, there's the documentary, The Disappearance of Madeleine McCann, which was aired on Netflix. It's still on Netflix if you haven't had a chance to look at it. Um, It's a very detailed analysis of the case. And I will reference some of these sources later in the episode. So just to give you a brief timeline, this is by no means exhaustive, but just some of the key dates is a very short episode. On May 3rd, 2007, Madeline, aged just three, goes missing from her family's vacation room in Praia de Luz, Portugal, while her parents dine at a nearby restaurant. Now, just to give you a bit of background, Jerry and Kate travelled with friends of theirs, other parents, and they collectively made the decision that while they would dine in the tapas restaurant every night, they would have their children Uh, in their respective rooms asleep and they would go and check on them and they felt that this was a better arrangement for the children than say putting them into the hotel uh, crash and then having to disrupt their sleep and carry them back to the room etc. So they decided to do this setting up a kind of uh, informal routine of just regularly checking on the children. Now, Jane Tanner, on the day that Madeline would go missing, said that she saw a man carrying a small child uh, in his arms and that she now thought in retrospect, could this have been Madeline's abductor? And this man became known as the Tanner Man sighting. So on May 14th, 2007, Robert Marat, a British man living in Portugal, is named as an Arguido, an official suspect by Portuguese police less than two weeks after Madeleine's disappearance. He denies any involvement in her case. May 12th, 2007, Madeleine turned four years old. And I suspect that actually she never got to experience that milestone, that she was probably at this stage already deceased. But I will talk about that in a little bit more detail. Here we see Jerry and Kate appealing to the Portuguese media after Madeline's disappearance. Now, it must have been something of a poisoned chalice for Jerry and Kate. Can you imagine the anguish of your child disappearing? And then you have to deal with an intrusive media, a 
global intrusive media because they started to descend from all over the world, the media on to uh, Prairie de Luge. But also Jerry and Kate needed the media. They needed to get the word out about Madeleine. And they also uh, were also, you know, appealing directly to whoever had taken Madeleine to return her. So they very much needed the media, but were also simultaneously being um, sort of harassed by the media. So it must have been the most intense experience. I, I just can't even imagine. By the way, I've included links to any of the newspaper sources that I've used uh, under the YouTube video if you want to do any further reading. So on September 7th, 2007, Portuguese police named Kate and Jerry McCann as official suspects in their daughter's disappearance. They were later cleared of any sort of suspicion and suspect status was lifted. But I can imagine that that too must have been um, incredibly harrowing. Um, and of course, Kate has said in subsequent interviews that every time the spotlight of suspicion was on them, it made them feel as if nobody was out looking for their daughter. Now, October 21st, 2007, Murat's Arguido status is lifted and he continues to deny any wrongdoing, later winning libel damages from various media outlets for defamation. So I just want to go back for a moment to the Tanner Man or the Tanner sighting. And we can see the sketch on the right of the man that Jane Tanner saw that, you know, everybody thought, could this have been the person that abducted Madeline? Well, it would turn out that this was a completely innocent sighting, that this was just another holidaymaker collecting his daughter from the uh, hotel crash, essentially. And you can see that it is disruptive. His child has clearly sunk out. Perhaps she woke up when she got back to the hotel. So you can see what Jerry and Kate were trying to avoid. But leaving children alone in a room is never a good idea under any circumstances whatsoever. They could have an accident, a predator could break in. Um, it was just such an unwise decision. So on the left there, you see Julian Topman, who was essentially this man that had been collecting his child. And he's a GP. And I kind of found that to be a sort of tragic irony. You know, Kate's a GP, Jerry's a doctor. You kind of feel that, you know, people who are so intelligent and they, you know, are not lacking in money would make wiser decisions, you know. Um, and, you know, he clearly made the wide, wise decision, Julian. Something else that really struck me is how like Jerry Julian is. I mean, he looks so like him. And I kind of wondered the Martin Smith sighting of a man with a child. Um, Martin Smith is a fellow Irishman. I'm Irish myself. Um, could Martin have actually seen Julian? Now, I'm sure this has probably been looked into and it's not connected in any way, but just the likeness I found, Julian's likeness to Jerry, just incredible. Um, in any event, Julian's been completely, you know, ruled out as being in any way involved. He was just an innocent person enjoying his holiday and collecting his child. So on April 21st, 2022, Christian Bruckner is formally named as a suspect by Portuguese authorities. On May 22nd, 2023, Portuguese police aided by German and British counterparts searched the RK Dam Reservoir in Portugal for clues in relation to Madeleine's disappearance. Despite extensive investigations over the years, the case remains unsolved and Madeleine's parents continue to hope for her safe return. Now, they continue to buy her Christmas presents and birthday presents that I can imagine that those dates in particular must be, uh, you know, particularly heartbreaking. So I want to go back to um, the decision that the McCann's made to leave, you know, Madeline and her siblings in the holiday resort room by themselves. Now, they weren't the only ones to do this. There were also the other parents that they travel with who made the same choice. And I think in any, you know, in the majority of jurisdictions, you would actually be prosecuted for negligence and, and rightly so. But I actually do want to qualify by adding that I do think they just wanted their children to have a good night's sleep. They didn't want their children's sleep to be disruptive. And um, I'm just kind of startled more at the naivety 
of this decision. And I don't believe it's probably something they would have ever done had they been at home in England. Um, they were on holiday, they were letting their hair down. And I think that they just, in a moment of kind of relaxation, and they weren't the only one to make this decision, the other parents did too. They made this decision, kind of lulled by a full sense of safety, you know, in this family orientated resort. And I think it was um, incredibly naive. And something about Jerry and Kate does seem to me to have, at that point, I'm sure they're very different now, to have lacked a kind of street smarts that they weren't worldly wise. Um, you know, and there is a kind of naive quality about them, even though they're incredibly bright. Obviously, they're doctors, etc. And I think that there's probably other people out there in the world who have that sort of bright eyed, naive perspective on things. Um, when in actual fact, you know, even I just did a Google search on, you know, pedophiles and swimming pools. And you can see like hundreds of stories come up where pedophiles, these are kind of locations they like to hang around. And if you recall in the Madeleine McCann documentary on Netflix, one of the people who got to know the McCanns, who was holidaying in the same resort, said that she had seen a tall blonde man just loitering around on the day that Madeline disappeared. So, you know, they like these locations where children are at swimming pools, you know, they're scantily clothed, etc. Um, and certainly when I did a Google search, that is definitely borne out by the number of stories. So I think that, you know, this is a minority. Most people aren't very good, but just most people are kind of a bit more worldly wise and they know that these kind of characters can be around. And they just don't take their eye off their children. They have a great time, but they certainly are not going to leave them alone in a hotel room. So, yeah, I just think the kind of lack of street smarts, I think Kate and Jerry and those other parents displayed were, you know, was just really kind of mind boggling. I also looked at paedophiles and their behaviour around beaches. I just put in a Google search and hundreds of stories came up of paedophiles lurking around beaches. So, again, it's, um, you know, they're a minority overall, but I think this is why most parents, no matter where they go in the world, and even if it does feel very family oriented and very safe, they just don't take their eye off their children because, you know, uh, you just never know. But for the most part, the majority of people are very good and, and people go through life, you know, without encountering um, child abductors, etc. But, you know, uh, leaving a child in a room, I think, uh, in a hotel room is just never, ever in any circumstances something, you know, that is a good idea. You know, it, it really isn't. So, um, yeah, it just I, I think rather than a, a decision of negligence, which ultimately it was negligent, but I think that they they just seem to lack a kind of street smarts to a certain extent, you know, and um, yeah, that that's kind of my my, my feeling on it. So now we get to Christian Bruckner, who currently is the main suspect. And I do want to say that, you know, he hasn't been convicted of anything in relation to Madeleine McCann. He is obviously a key suspect and he's innocent until proven guilty in relation to this crime. He has been charged of other crimes, but certainly his profile and um, behaviours, criminal activities, uh, make him a very compelling suspect. And here's a story about Madeleine McCann, suspect had children's swimming costumes. So, you know, you can't have children's swimming costumes unless you're hanging around swimming pools. So, you know, perhaps Christian Bruckner, who was German, was attracted to Portugal because of the beaches and the resorts. And also we know that he liked to commit burglary. So there was ample opportunity to break into hotel rooms. So he certainly is a very compelling uh, suspect. So just to give you an idea of the kind of crimes that uh, Bruckner has been associated with, he's known to have sexually abused girls from a young age. He was first arrested in 1992 on suspicion of a burglary in his hometown. In 1994, when he was just 18, police sentenced him for the sexual abuse of children when he molested a six-year-old girl in a public playground. In 1995, he travelled to Portugal and began working as a caterer in the seaside resorts of Lake got some prior deluge and he also began to traffic drugs and it actually goes to 
goes on the piece to describe numerous other offences that Christian uh, have committed in relation to child molestation, theft, etc. Bruckner uh, also lived close to the resort from which uh, Madeline disappeared. So it's not hard to see why the police have suddenly honed in on him. We have to remember again that he hasn't been charged with anything. He's innocent until proven guilty, uh, charged with anything in relation to Madeline, that is. So, you know, we do have to bear that in mind. But it's not uh, difficult to see why Bruckner is such a compelling suspect. Bruckner is currently on trial in Germany for a range of sexual attacks. So I'll just go through those now. So in the same BBC uh, news article, we see a description of the charges that Bruckner is currently defending in court in Germany. Uh, They include the rape of a woman aged 70 to 80 in her holiday apartment in Portugal, the rape of a German speaking girl uh, of just 14 years of age, the rape of an Irish woman whose holiday flat he's alleged to have broken into. So here we can see the link of breaking into vacation apartments, the sexual abuse of a 10 year old German girl on a beach. This was just three and a half weeks before Madeleine disappeared. And there are other acts literally too heinous uh, to read out. But you get the general idea. And again, it is not difficult to see why Bruckner, you know, is being honed on. I guess the thing that is difficult to understand is why somebody with such an extensive rap sheet, uh, managed to kind of avoid scrutiny all this time by the Portuguese authorities, uh, you know, uh, and beyond. It, it is quite something, but he is being uh, looked at now, which obviously is an important development in the case. And again, as I said, he is innocent until proven guilty. More chilling still at the moment is, you know, the manner in which prosecutors across jurisdictions are now looking at unsolved cases. So German prosecutors at the moment are investigating whether Bruckner was involved in the disappearance of a five-year-old girl uh, in Germany in 2015. They're also looking at the disappearance of a six-year-old German boy in Portugal in 1996. So, uh, you know, that is incredibly uh, eerie to think that, you know, potentially he could be involved in these cases and that the uh, police authorities are, you know, reviewing uh, old cases and, and wondering, could he potentially have been linked to these cases. Another case that police have wondered could Bruckner have been involved in is the murder of Tristan Brubach in Frankfurt in Germany. He was a teenager who was brutally murdered, stabbed multiple times. His body was also mutilated after death. And the reason that the police wondered, could Bruckner have been involved in this is due to the brutality of the case. I mean, it is coming out in the trial in Germany currently that, you know, he enjoyed performing statistic acts on his rape victims, beating them, whipping them, etc. And um, this is why they were wondering this was a particularly brutal case. Could he have been linked to this? And also his interest in young children, etc. Another factor that made them wonder could Bruckner be connected to this case was the likeness of the photo fit from witnesses, et cetera, to uh, Bruckner's uh, photo. Um, So, you know, this case, again, is another case that prosecutors are are thinking could Bruckner have been involved. Again, we have to say he's not been charged with anything. Um, You know, this is speculative. Um, But his name has been mentioned in relation to this case uh, informally. And um, one of the things that I I found interesting about this case is that it gives you an idea into how child predators and predators generally, because he didn't just prey on children, Bruckner, he doesn't just prey on children, but how they can engage in a very broad range of sexual behaviours that we would find, you know, just abhorrent. So the mutilation of a dead body, for example. So it just goes to show that, you know, 
often they don't care if their victim is alive or death. dead. Usually a sadist would probably prefer their victim to be alive. But we can see from cases like this that they will often continue sadistic acts after the person has deceased. And it did make me wonder about the Madeleine McCann case and the cadaver dogs and the smell of death, etc. Is it possible that Madeleine did die in the apartment that night, but not at the hands of the McCanns, but at the hands of a predator who wouldn't care whether the victim was alive or dead? The main thing is to get that victim out of the apartment. Madeline may have been a difficult person to overwhelm, a difficult child, should I say. She was very rambunctious. Uh, you know, perhaps she was strangled before she even left the apartment just as an expedient act, as a, a convenience so that he could get her quietly out of the apartment or perhaps she was drugged, etc. So um, I think that one of the aspects of the investigation of Madeline's case that perhaps has been overlooked is that, you know, one has to remember that some of these predators, particularly predators of children, um, they can engage in things you know, that are that are very dark to the average normal person. And uh, I think that when you understand that uh, about a potential predator, then I think it opens up a number of possibilities in terms of what happened to Madeline in that apartment on that night, uh, you know, as I said, some predators, they don't care if the victim is alive or dead. The main thing is to get them out of that apartment uh, quietly uh, without detection, etc. So this is a piece from CBS News and it talks about that information from the cell tower. Investigators discovered that on the night Madeline disappeared, a call was made to Bruckner's uh, cell phone approximately one hour before she went missing. That data puts Bruckner's cell phone at or near the location of the McCann's vacation apartment where Madeline vanished. The question is, was the phone in Bruckner's possession or did someone else answer that call? So um, at the moment, investigators, they don't have forensic evidence in any way linking Bruckner to, uh, McCann, to to the disappearance of Madeleine McCann, but they are gradually trying to piece together, you know, circumstantial evidence. And I guess it's still early days and that's why a formal charge, you know, has not yet been made. The stakes are high and they obviously want to get their ducks in a, in a row. So I highly recommend if you want to get up to speed with how the Model McCann case is progressing, checking out this 60 Minutes documentary, Australia. And in it, they interview German prosecutor Hans Christian Walters, who has stated that, you know, they have pretty strong circumstantial evidence that Madeline is dead and that Christian Bruckner is responsible for this. They don't have forensic evidence. It's still quite vague in terms of what evidence they have. It appears to be things like emails. Uh, I have seen him in a previous interview asked whether they had an item of clothing. You know, did they find an item of clothing belonging to Madeline in, say, Bruckner's vehicles? He didn't deny it. He didn't, you know, uh, say it was true either. Uh, but certainly he's saying that they 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 have significant cir circumstantial evidence that they just are piecing together and they're not quite ready to charge, but that they are, you know, working on this currently and that it's it's very compelling evidence. So, um, yeah, it's fascinating. I have seen Hans criticised for speaking out in this fashion, you know, prior to an actual formal charge being made. You know, if you've got enough evidence, people are saying, well, why don't you, you know, make the formal charge? But I guess given the magnitude of this case, the interest in this case globally, they're probably pretty close to to, you know, potentially charging Bruckner, I would imagine. And, you know, perhaps the sense was that it would be wise to make an announcement at this juncture, um, particularly as well when you think of what the parents have gone through in terms of the suspicion that has fallen on them. So, um, yeah, this is a very interesting documentary and I certainly recommend uh, looking at it. So this is Helga Bushing, a former friend of Bruckner's who's interviewed in the 60 Minutes documentary. And again, I highly recommend this documentary. And he states that Bruckner told him that he did abduct Madeleine McCann. Now, he told um, uh, Helga that he, you know, found that she went quietly. She didn't scream. 
is how he described it to Bushing, which led Bushing to believe that Brooklyn most likely drugged Madeline. And he felt that he did this using something like car paint solvent, which easily overwhelms young children. Now, one might wonder what would make Bushing uh, a reliable informant. He's also a criminal, but apparently he has provided information which police were able to corroborate fully in relation to charges that have been brought against Bruckner. Uh, so everything he has, any information he's provided to date, has, uh, you know, aligned and lined up, so to speak. So this is, uh, you know, a uh, compelling evidence, which again, I think will be added to the evidence that is accumulating, albeit circumstantial and not forensic, but it is accumulating against uh, Bruckner. Interestingly, here's a newspaper article just reporting on the trial that Bruckner is undergoing presently. And in court, it was said that, you know, the German drifter used a rape drug to incapacitate victims. So, you know, he was capable of drugging um, victims, and it's possible that he could have um, he could have drugged Madeline, or, or even worse, potentially have killed her. Um, you know, or even killed her. You know, using the paint solvent. I think that's a much more likely explanation than um, you know Kate having over administered um, you know, Calpol or something like that to, to make the children sleep. I, I think that if she did die in that apartment and certainly the cadaver dogs, et cetera, picked up the scent of death, blood, et cetera, that potentially she died as a result of excessive paint solvent inhalation or potentially she was just killed to silence her before she left the apartment. If Bruckner is involved and, and as I said, he's still suspect and innocent until proven guilty. Looking at the academic literature, you can see that actually things like paint thinners, paint solvers, they can, if given in large doses, induce immediate death. You know, perhaps he administered something that for a very young child, it was too much and, and she was dead before she even left the apartment. Uh, you know, so uh, perhaps he tried to get her out of a window. So he just sort of sneak out that way. Maybe that didn't work out. He dropped her behind the sofa or, you know, um, there was a chase in the room and, you know, it might explain why there's spots around the room um, and that maybe she hadn't been a very easy victim to uh, overwhelm. So I just want to talk about something that is a little dark. And if you are uh, sensitive to themes pertaining to sadism, etc., please do uh, feel free to fast forward by maybe five, six minutes to avoid the discussion of this particular topic, but I want to talk about necrosadism. And this is an article in the Journal of Forensic Psychiatry and Psychology. And it talks about necrosadism. And I had always thought that sadists, so we know, for example, that Christian Bruckner enjoyed uh, sadism. He liked to inflict sadistic acts such as whipping, etc., while raping his victims. This has all emerged um, in the trial in Germany that is ongoing. But something that I didn't know is that predators who enjoy sadistic acts can also enjoy sadistic acts on dead bodies. Now, I thought that sadists kind of thrived on the victim being alive and seeing their reaction and seeing their fear. And we can certainly see those details have emerged in the Christian Bruckner case. But actually, they engage in a broad range of behaviours that can also extend to inflicting, you know, mutilation after a victim has died. So I want to go back for a second to the Tristan Brubach case. Now, poor Tristan, such a tragic, sad case. He suffered violent injuries while he was alive and his body shortly after death was also mutilated. But shortly after his death, it appeared that his grave had been vandalised. It almost looked as if there was an attempt to somehow dig him up. Now, authorities at the time put this down to perhaps the behaviour of somebody who was mentally unstable. But when you read this article about necrosadism, which is somebody who enjoys inflicting kind of mutilating injuries on dead bodies and will often kill for that purpose, it interviews a man who was involved in murdering four men and he, you know, engaged in necrosadism, which is, you know, mutilating dead bodies. And he, um, 
express a desire to go back and find that body and inflict further mutilation. And it did get me wondering, due to the sadistic nature of Tristan's death, had the perpetrator of that crime gone back to the grave to somehow relive that crime and somehow be close to that body, potentially dig it up. And I think that's something that hasn't been explored. But the reason that I wanted to explore this topic generally is that I think to understand what happened to Madeline um, is we have to understand the broad range of deviant behaviours that some of these predators can behave in. And they can have no qualms about being sadistic while a victim is alive, but equally when the victim is dead. Um, and in this article, you know, you really get a, a sense of, you know, some perpetrators, they don't care if the victim is alive or dead. And we have to remember that some well-known predators in the UK, including Jimmy Savile, for example, engaged in necrophilia, um, engaged in sexual acts with uh, dead bodies. So, this is a range of behavior that is so dark and is so twisted that it is impossible for the regular human mind to even understand it. And I think that that's why when Madeline's, you know, when when the, when the potential scent of death, potentially of, of Madeline was found in the apartment, you know, immediately everybody thought it was the parents. But this equally could have been a predator who enjoyed sadistic acts, maybe found it difficult to get her out of the apartment, found it easier to kill her before leaving the apartment and potentially could still inflict sadistic acts. Um, and one can only hope, actually, that in some ways Madeline would have been better off dead before she left that apartment if somebody like Christian Bruckner was the person who took her. And we have to remember that Christian Bruckner has not been charged with any offences relating to Tristan Brubach or any offences relating to Madeline, so is innocent until proven uh, guilty. But just more generally, I think that we have to um, expand our mindset in terms of, you know, the kind of behaviours that some of these hardcore predators uh, can engage in. They're just, you know, sick behaviour. It's too sick to comprehend. And uh, I think it's possible that a predator, uh, a sadistic predator could have broken into the apartment that night. And, you know, it, it may have been a struggle to get Madeline out of the apartment and he may just have strangled her as an expediency, as a convenience to get her out quietly. Or she may have died due to excessive inhalation of you know, paint solvent or something like that. The, these solvents are incredibly strong. Um, you know, so I, I'm just saying that this is, you know, potentially a possibility and it's just something that has to be considered. And this is, um, you know, a f very deviant form of sexual behaviour. It's covered in the Journal of Forensic Psychiatry and Psychology for a reason, because even though these sorts of uh, acts are very rare, um, they do occasionally arise and, and you know, are carried out by certain types of, you know, hardcore sadistic predators. Something else that I want to say is that often the McCanns are accused of being emotionless. Um, but I've actually come across quite a few videos where, you know, the pain and the anguish is just sketched all over their faces. And um, interviews in which Kate, for example, has cried. I think that they were instructed not to be too emotional in case the abductor would panic and kill Madeline. We've got to remember that. And I think also that there's something in their makeup, their doctors, you know, doctors are so goal orientated, action orientated. And I think that, you know, they just, they have, they have behaviours that we would find it hard to understand. The, you know, the rest of us would be walking wrecks. But these are, you know, a doctor, very driven person, goal orientated. And I think that they were trying to carry on as normal in ways that were difficult for us to understand, such as jogging, for example. But I think this was just their way of coping, of trying to do usual habitual things keep focused, keep the goals in mind, et cetera. And I think people have made far too much. I think Pat Brown, for example, she makes a lot of this, the fact that, you know, Kate McCann has her outfits matched up and she's jogging. And I totally get it. But I actually just think it was their way of just clinging on to some sort of normality and keeping calm because they needed to keep calm to find their daughter.
And this is an interesting study in BMC Medical Education, uh, Springer Nature, and it looked at the personality traits of health professionals. And I took some quotes from this study, and it said that health professional groups, they try to be direct, objective, factual, structured planning, decisive, controlled and committed. And we can say for sure that one thing Kate and Jerry were and have been is very controlled, but I, I just think it's their way of, you know, coping. And I think, you know, the nature of their profession, the kind of personality that can be drawn to that profession is very much aligned to those kind of characteristics. It also says in the article that nurses and medical practitioners were found to have higher levels of dominance and lower levels of abstractness. And they tended to be, you know, grounded, practical, solution orientated. And again, we can see this in the McCanns who desperately tried to carry on as normal after their daughter disappeared. So another thing that we have to consider is that Perhaps the cadaver dogs were not correct. Um, maybe Madeline was just taken out of the apartment alive. I personally believe that it is possible, very possible, that Madeline was killed in the apartment by a predator before you know she left that apartment. But you know we do also have to consider that cadaver dogs can be inaccurate. And this is a really interesting study in Forensic Science International, published in 2014 which actually did a very large scale trial of the accuracy of cadaver dogs. So I just talk through the results of that now. And, and the study did show that cadaver dogs can indeed, while having a high level of accuracy, they can also uh, make mistakes, even when they're, uh, you know, highly trained. And in that study, it found that two Labrador retriever cadaver dogs performed a total of 2,920 trials to detect human blood at varying concentrations. And dog A had 18 false positives out of 720 trials, while dog B had 39 false positives. Now, you can see it's still a very high degree of accuracy, but it does demonstrate that even well-trained dogs can have, um, you know, false, false alerts. I'm inclined to think uh, as time goes on that it is possible that Madeline actually did die in the apartment that night. Um, one has to wonder how the cadavers picked up on the scent of death or blood in the vehicle that the McCann's had rented. But this could just be transference from items that they touched. The smell of death is very strong, perhaps, um, you know. There has been a question mark about the viability of the sample in the uh, rental car. Journalists have since gone on record that doubted the McCann's previously as saying that they they weren't aware of, you know, the inaccurate information that was supplied around, you know, the findings relating to the uh, boot of the car, etc. So, um, yeah, it, it's another possibility that perhaps, you know, Madeline to get out of the apartment alive that night was taken by a predator and there was no death at all. Um, you know, that's something else that has to be considered. I don't know. As time goes on, I suspect that Madeline potentially did die in the in the apartment that night. Perhaps um too much paint solvent could have been something as simple as that. I I, I think that's much more likely than um you know, Kate having given too much cowpole. She was a GP. I mean, if she couldn't get the amount of cowpole right, nobody could. You know, so I, I think it's it's there's a strong possibility Madeline did die. And you know what? If she did before she left that apartment, maybe that was actually a good thing. Um, you know, the more we learn about some of these uh, predators and the range of sadistic behaviours they can engage in. Something else that I want to mention is that Kate, in her book, Madeline, was very much vilified for discussing her daughter's genitals and the worry of what happened to her daughter and did she suffer pain. And people found this mention of her daughter's private parts very inappropriate. Well, I actually think it's very natural. A young child is abducted by a predator. Will she suffer? What will happen to her? I, I actually think it's very natural. And I think it was very unfair that it was found to be weird or indicative of some kind of, you know, 
strange situation. I, I mean, I think it's a perfectly natural parental response. And just to demonstrate that, there's this documentary. It's excellent. It's on YouTube, Who Killed Stuart Lubrick. Um, it's about a young man who's found dead in a swimming pool. Um, he had horrific anal injuries. There was speculation that he was the victim of rape. And when Stuart's father found out about the anal injuries, he was consumed with sorrow, sadness. He just couldn't stop thinking how his son suffered. Does that make Stuart's father a weirdo? Absolutely not. I think it's a natural parental response. And I think that Kate has been really unfairly vilified, um, you know, for having this concern. When you think of the how the McCants have been from the uh, have been through from the court of public opinion, etc., and the Portuguese police, um, this is a piece on the BBC uh, News about how the Portuguese police have apologised to Madeleine McCants' parents. Uh, I think there's many people that still believe the McCants uh, killed their daughter. I mean, these are people that have fertility treatment. They wanted children. They wanted a family. It just makes no sense. I, I, I think so much of the accusations levied against the McCants just don't add up. Um, when you look at the modus operandi of someone like Bruckner. And again, we have to say he's just a suspect. He has not been charged and is innocent until proven guilty. Breaking into apartments, you know, molesting young children. I, I just don't understand why people aren't thinking more along the lines of a predator um, than the McCants. I, I think they made a grave mistake that evening. I've no doubt they're aware of that and it sits very heavily with them. But I honestly don't think that they were in any way responsible for the disappearance of their daughter. So here we see Kate and Jerry uh, all these years later. And I can't even imagine the anguish that they have suffered during that period. They made, you know, a catastrophic decision and there is no other way to record it. But I think that they have done their time in terms of mental anguish, suffering, it must be truly just the most incredible burden. And I do hope that they find peace and that they get answers. And I do believe that the answers are coming and we are getting closer to finding out what happened to Madeline. Something else that I want to point out is that more recently they've sort of been vilified for why, you know, or there's questions asked as to why do they go to Portugal so much and why do they go running in the hills around, you know, the resort where Madeline went missing. Well, Kate once had a dream and she thought that Madeline had been buried in the hills. And I think perhaps this is, you know, where she feels is the most likely location for her daughter's death. You know, um, we've got to remember the Moramari case. They don't have a body. They don't know what happened to their daughter, but they go to the last place where Moore had crashed a car and that's where they remember her every year. So people will select a surrogate location to remember their loved ones in the absence of having that real final resting place. And I think that's all that is at play here. I think that that's just somewhere where somehow in their hearts they feel that she was probably buried there. And I think people are reading far too too much, you know, into that, you know, they must have buried the body up there, etc. I, I, I think it's false. I, I just don't think that Kate and Jerry, no one has ever explained the motivation for wanting to kill their daughter. I don't believe that Kate, who's a GP, would incorrectly, um, you know, administer Calpol, etc. I, I just think they made an unfortunate decision. And I think that the facts of the case align much more with a predator, you know, taking Madeline than with anything else, you know. So I, I really do hope that they get the answers. I can't even imagine what it must be like to live in that, this sort of limbo where you, you just don't know. And I do really hope that, you know, those answers come and they come soon. I believe they will come soon. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, it would be lovely to see them know fully what happened, their daughter. Thank you so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Please do subscribe, comment, share, like every comment, every new subscriber. It thrills me to pieces. I actually reply to all of the comments. Um, this was a difficult episode. 
I really hope that Kate, Jerry and their other children uh, find out what happened to lovely Madeline, such a bright, full of life child. I, I hope those answers come soon. Thank you so much again for watching and for all your support. And I look forward to seeing you in the next episode of Dark Vanishings. All the very best. Take care.